Thank you very much. Um, I'm not known as a snappy dresser, but I have to say that the only reason I look good today is because the organizers of this wonderful conference at UWC um, <clears throat> forced me to wear this shirt. <laughs> they gave me the, the instructions of what shirts I could and couldn't wear, so thank you very much. I had no choice in the matter, which is ironic because I'm going to tell you today <clears throat> about uh, free will. So why do we feel we have free will? So first of all, who here believes that they have free will, that they possess free will, they have the freedom to choose? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. Good. Most people here do. Okay. Who here believes that if the world is completely deterministic, so all our choices are completely determined beforehand, that we still possess free will? A lot fewer people. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is kind of a problem, right? Because actually the world is deterministic and our choices are determined beforehand. So why do we believe we possess free will? So um, this picture right here is a picture. This is, this is my idea of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I, yeah, PowerPoint is Satan. Um, uh, life is too short for bullet points. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> it's true. Let, uh, this is a, a picture of Alan Turing, who was um, known to, as well known as the inventor of the concept of a digital computer. Um, he was a, a British mathematician. Actually, he was uh, homosexual, and uh, he was persecuted by the British government, and he killed himself by eating a poisoned apple. And um, <clears throat> he uh, uh, came up with the notion of a computer which he called a Turing machine, and this is a picture of a Turing machine. The notion of a computer, a computer in Turing's day was actually someone who, a person, usually a woman, who would compute things and do calculations. They are women because, as we all know, women are better at math than men. So, and uh, Turing abstracted this notion of a, of a computer, think, well, what does a computer do? Uh, of someone who's actually doing computation, well, she sits there and she does some calculations, and then she picks up another sheet of paper and she writes on this one. She goes, hmm, and she goes back to the first one, she erases something and she does something more. So he said, okay, a computer is something that has a head, it can think, and this is a picture of the head of a computer, and it's got pieces of paper or squares of tape, and it just moves along, doing things to these squares of tape, erasing things, changing something, going back, and going forward again. And that's the idea of a, comp of a computer. And he Turing showed that a very simple model like this actually was capable of doing any kind of computation that one could imagine. And in fact, the same computations that our computers themselves perform. So um, <clears throat> now, Turing came up with the notion of a Turing test, which was a test to see if a computer could behave like a human. The original Turing test was you imagine that you are communicating through a, let's say, your computer with something on the far end, and that something could either be another human being or it could be a computer program. And your job is to figure out if the thing on the other side is a human being or a computer program. And if the computer program fools you into believing that it, the computer, is a human being, then it has so-called pass the Turing test. That is, there's a test to see if it's human, and it actually passed one of these tests. Of course, you have to feel sorry for the human beings who fail the Turing test. I don't know what we're supposed to do with them. <laughs> okay, so what does this have to do to free, with free will? I'm going to argue in a moment this has everything to do with free will. And the question of free will is not about whether things move deterministically or all our thoughts and actions are determined beforehand, but rather it's a question of what happens inside our heads when we try to contemplate what our decisions are going to be. What should I have for lunch? You know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Should I have caffeinated coffee or decaffeinated coffee? Well, decaf is safer, but caffeine is more exciting, right? So which should it be, right? This is a common problem that I have. Well, <laughs> before I actually make the decision, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, the only decisions that I know beforehand I'm going to do are the decisions like when the organizers of this meeting 
asked me to come down here because I only had to think for a nanosecond there. I said, of course I'm going to come to this fantabulous UWC TEDx event. So, uh, so the notion that determinism is bad for free will goes back 2,500 years at least, certainly in Western philosophy. Here is a, a picture of Epicurus. He was an atomist. He believed, like Democritus, that things were made out of atoms. And he says, oh, well, you know, atoms move deterministically, but they occasionally perform a small swerve. And why do they perform a small swerve? Because otherwise, Epicurus said, we couldn't have free will, because everything would be determined. And Epicurus, like many of the people here in this room, believed that if everything was determined beforehand, we couldn't have free will. And so actually for thousands of years, people thought that this was the case, and there was a problem here, because in the 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton, looking style in here, I may say, uh, <laughs> came up with what we, the origins of the modern laws of physics, and these laws were completely deterministic. So the motions of the planets around the sun were completely determined by their current positions and velocities. The motions of Newtonian particles or atoms were completely determined by where they're moving and how they bounce off of each other. So the laws of physics are deterministic, and that's kind of a bummer if you want to have free will. Epicurus wouldn't have approved. Um, many people started talking about this. James Clerk Maxwell um, noted that if you have sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the so-called butterfly effect, or a butterfly flapping its wings, wings somewhere out there in the Caribbean right now can cause a hurricane two months down the line. And then in the 20th century, quantum mechanics came along, and quantum mechanics was intrinsically probabilistic. So people said, whew, baby, now at last, as Eddington said, or Sir Arthur Eddington said, it kind of um, said, the laws of nature finally withdraw their objections to free will. But actually, does, does randomness save free will? I would say not. You know, if I, if I have to make a decision, the caffeinated, decaffeinated decision, I can't make up my mind. I'm looking at the benefits of one thing rather than the other, and I flip a coin, I say, heads, you know, it's caffeine, tails is decaf. I'm not actually making the decision. I'm giving up the decision to the coin. So it's really not being probabilistic that gives you free will. So what, in fact, is going on inside our brains when we think? And in fact, there's quite a, um, an attack on free will by neuroscientists these days because neuroscientists like this one who's poking at my brain, uh, uh, they now can, if they put electrodes in your brain, they can tell a few hundredths of a second before you actually make a decision of what your decision will be, before you yourself, you yourself know it. So they say, okay, aha, you don't have free will. This is wrong. Okay? Why is it wrong? It's because if you think of something that's making a decision, like in this case our little Turing machine, how does it work? You say, let's say with the coffee or decaf question, it's like, hmm, what's going to happen to me if I like have caffeinated coffee? Let me think down the line what's going to happen at like, you know, midnight when I'm trying to go to sleep and I can't go to sleep because I had too much coffee in the afternoon. Should I do that or should I not do it, right? So <laughs> one of the features of these Turing machines, these computers, is that they can actually model themselves. So a so-called universal Turing machine is one that's capable of modeling any other computing device, including the computers that we have. And now there's a problem here, because when you make a model of yourself, your model of yourself is always less detailed than you yourself are. So it's less precise, it contains fewer details, and here we see a, a computer that's modeling itself, and the computer and its model is modeling itself, it's modeling itself, and you see, as you get more and more nested, the models have to become ever less detailed. And that means that a Turing machine or a computer cannot predict what decision it's going to make. Because the only way for it to actually figure out always what it's going to do is actually to go ahead and do it. Its model of what it's going to do will always be incomplete, so it will be not predictive. It will be incomplete and cannot predict what it's going to do. And this actually is true of human beings as well. So, but, oh, so this goes under the name of this problem, goes under the name of this, the halting problem. You can show that if you try to ask the question of whether you're going to be able to answer the question of whether you're going to, anyway, you just get in this infinite loop 
and you never end up halting and giving an answer to the question. And human beings have the same feature. So here is a, a human computer, maybe based on Lucille Ball because she has red hair. And you see her contemplating herself, contemplating herself, thinking about what she's going to do, thinking about what she's going to do. And of course, the models, as you go further down this regression, become less and less precise until the last little model looks just like a little kind of blob there. Who knows what it's going to do or not. So human beings also cannot predict what they're going to do. And it has nothing whatsoever to do with whether the universe is deterministic or whether it's probabilistic. It has to do with the nature of modeling oneself, of thinking, what am I going to do? So now this actually brings up a, an, an interesting question. Because simulating yourself is either slower, less detailed, or more chancy than just being yourself. This is kind of like, this is kind of a nice sort of like, you know, zen-like thing, right? You might as well just be yourself. Forget about, you know, forget about those decisions you have to make. Then what things out there actually possess free will? Oh, and uh, uh, this, this, this is, you know, uh, just to emphasize, that this is not just, I'm not just making this off, off the top of my head. I'm going to call this a theorem. It actually is a famous theorem from computer science, this hart marnus stern theorem, that says, if you have something that can make a model of itself, and it tries to predict what it's going to do, then predicting with certainty what you're going to decide to do in an hour from now takes more than an hour. That's just the way it is. You can't figure it out in general. So I, I just put this up there just to like make it, give it that, you know, the veneer of mathematics, you know, to, to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to make it seem like it's actually true. That's what mathematics like PowerPoint is, is for. <laughs> now this is true whether the universe is deterministic or probabilistic. And it's true whether the universe is classical, as Newton said it was, or quantum mechanical, because we know the universe is quantum mechanical. And so I'd like to propose a test to figure out if you're free will. So <clears throat> when I asked whether people here believe that they have free will, and most of the people here raised their hand, I, I put it to you that maybe you were thinking something like this. So here, here is a test. First of all, are you a decider? Right? Are you making the decisions? This is like our former president in the United States, George W. Bush, famously said, I am the decider, right? Could he model his behavior and that of others? I don't know. But uh, can I model my behavior and that of others? Okay, I'm a decider and make decisions. I'm a human being, so I can model what I'm going to do, and I can also model what other people are going to do. And then the third question is, can you predict your own decisions? And this, of course, is the trick question, because if you answered all three Yes, then you're lying, right? And since this is a self-administered test, right, there's no point in lying. The only person you're cheating is yourself by doing this. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, who has free will? Who is going to pass this? If you have something like um, a thermostat, or a mushroom, for that matter, um, <clears throat> then a thermostat has only two possible states. It's either like, okay, it's not too cold, it's not too cold, it's not too cold. Oh, it's too cold, turn on the furnace. Oh, okay, getting warmer, getting warmer, getting warmer. Okay, now it's not too cold, let's turn off the furnace. It doesn't have enough calculational gumption to model itself at all. So it, it, can't, it cannot possess free will by this, because it can't even ask the question. Dogs and cats? Well, my guess is probably so. Dogs and cats have a model of the world. They probably are thinking about what they're going to be eating in a few minutes from now. They're wondering what they're going to do. My guess would they probably do. I don't know for sure, but I think they would probably pass this test. Um, trees, fungi, bacteria? I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, <clears throat> however, if you look at things like computers, or smartphones for that matter, the answer is, Sadly and unequivocally, yes. Why is this true? It's because something like a computer or a computer program is always making decisions. The operating system in your computer is always making decisions, right and left. The operating system has to decide how much memory space, how many machine cycles to allocate to the different programs that run on the computer. 
Does it have a sense of self-reference? Yes, it does, because it is a program in the computer. And when the operating system is allocating space to the different programs, let's say it's number 42, it has to model, well, how much space does program number 42 need? Now, program number 42 is it. It's referring to itself. It, it doesn't have to be conscious of itself, but it has a sense of self-reference. And because of this, then it certainly cannot predict exactly how much space it's going to need. And in fact, that's why computers crash. So, um, <clears throat> uh, I think that this notion of free will, it's for thousands of years people have thought that whether we have free will or not is a question about whether the universe is deterministic or not. But since Alan Turing showed us how we can talk about things that think, or at any rate, things that can do computation and have the capacity to model themselves, we've learned in the last 50 or 60 years that this means that things that can model themselves, model their own behavior, and can ask themselves the question, what decision are they going to make? Those things, like you and me, and unfortunately like your smartphone, those things will not be able to predict their decisions, and those are very good candidates for having free will. Thank you very much.